A warm greeting this morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church. On this second Sunday in which we stay at home due to the Omicron variant of COVID-19 coming through our region strongly, we are sheltering in place. And blessings to you as you tune in on your computer or phone or whatever device. We are thankful you are with us and we with you. So let us be in the house of the Lord, for it is a beautiful day to worship the Lord in Ypsilanti. And I say unto you, the peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. Here at the font of grace and remembrance and care, let us offer our prayer today. For Almighty God, you wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature. In your mercy, let us share the divine life of Jesus Christ, who came to share our humanity and now lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.
a prayer for illumination as we listen to the scriptures this morning. For Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Two stories. The first comes from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth as he talks to them about the gift of communion and follows up in today's reading with the gifts of the Spirit for the upbuilding of the community, that they might be one. The following is the beginning of the Gospel of John, the first story about Jesus in chapter 2 in the wedding at Cana, a story in which we take delight, for God takes delight in us. Listen for the word of the Lord. Now concerning spiritual gifts, writes Paul, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of services, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. Now the reading from the Gospel of John in the second chapter, verses 1 through 11. On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rite of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water, it had become wine, and he did not know where it came from, though the servants who drew the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. And Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Paul teaching us about the power of the spirit of gifts for the common good. Oftentimes we want to divide those gifts up, or we want to make a hierarchy out of the gifts even worse. But Paul tells us they're all for the given for the common good. Today, Jesus does something else for the common good at that wedding in Cana to keep the party going. I think I've observed in the past, isn't it interesting that Jesus begins his ministry, the first miracle, by throwing a party? I think at this point in the pandemic, as we begin year three, we could all use a good party if we could only gather a little more safely. My wife and I are already contemplating one in the middle of this summer when things calm down. The name of our party is Stick a Fork in It. We're kind of done with it. 
But today we get joy breaking through. For this is what grace looks like. Grace, that confusing word in the Christian lexicon, it's central to our identity, but it's often hard to define, let alone describe in a concrete and meaningful way. Consider, some Bible translations have worked with grace as it appears in verse Romans in the third chapter. Now they are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. The wonderful New Testament scholar J.B. Phillips back in the 1960s described it as God's generous dealing with us. God is generous. Modern scholar Eugene Peterson offers in his Bible the message. He talks about God putting us right in standing out of sheer generosity and talks about grace as a gift. An undeserved gift for certain, but a gift. There are great attempts at making what the Christian tradition means by grace, to make it more concrete and accessible. It strikes me that this is a bit like the describing Describing it, this is a bit more like describing what a hug is versus experiencing one. I think we can all lay hands on that one. I hear the words, I'll give you a hug, but I don't really feel it or know it in any deep way. Another way is what we have in today's story. This story from John become because John moves beyond just saying it's a free gift and generosity, this grace, to remind us that grace also means abundance, an unbelievable, more than you can possibly imagine, abundance. And what better way to picture it than a feast at a wedding, ancient or modern? This story also has the advantage of giving us a picture and the pictures from this wedding are so clear and available to all of us. Perhaps it's been a while since you've been to a wedding, given the pandemic and all. But we all have been there. We have all experienced it, I certainly pray, as a guest or in your own wedding. Keep in mind for a moment the scene. Jesus and his disciples are at a wedding, and the host runs out of wine. Inconvenient, we'll probably must acknowledge, perhaps for some embarrassing, but it really is that really such a big deal? Well, it turns out, yes, it is in Jesus' time and maybe now a days too. Well, in his time and place, running out of wine too early isn't just a social faux pas. It's really a disaster. For wine isn't just a social lubricant, though our text clearly makes it clear that the guests by this time were drunk. But it's also a sign of harvest, that God has provided for the land and the fruit of the land, and this fruit was given for joy and gladness and hospitality, to share and to welcome. So when they run short on wine, they run short on blessing. Now I think you can see how it is a tragedy. In steps Jesus, prompted by his mother, and he provides not just more wine, but more wine than the whole crowd could have drunk, not only during the three days of the wedding feast, but possibly also across three weeks. In changing the water of those six large basins into a pure wine, you see, Jesus is providing close to an additional thousand bottles. Not only that, but as the surprise steward discovered, it's not just a cheap bottle of two-buck chuck, but it's the best wine yet served. And that, according to John, is what grace is like, an overflowing of joy, blessing, the presence of God. Like other beginnings in life, First things mentioned in the gospel matter. Mark begins Jesus' ministry with the exercising of a demon as the first thing Jesus does after he flees to the wilderness. 
after his baptism. And Luke, as we'll see over the next two weeks, reports that the first thing Jesus did is to preach a sermon of release and freedom and healing. Each of these things matters. They set the tone and reveal the purposes of God. Exercising demons, release of the captives, freedom and healing. Each gospel shows us why God became flesh and how God works. From being born as a vulnerable baby amidst the poor, to healing, preaching the good news to the captives, and celebrating a wedding. Which is why it's significant that in the fourth gospel, John describes the first thing that Jesus does as providing more wine, more joy, and blessings than this couple or any couple could possibly have imagined or deserved. Because that's what grace looks like. This seems to me like a very timely message to share, particularly as it is so incredibly needed then and now. I mean, look around. About the only things folks can talk about today is scarcity. We don't have enough money or enough food to go around or security, or power, or medicine. The reason we do this is rather simple, actually, it turns out. We've been predisposed by, all the way back to the very beginning, to pay attention to scarcity and fear so that we can live. Think about it. If you miss an opportunity, that might be a bit of a bummer, but if you miss acknowledging a real threat, including running out of something essential, well, maybe it just might be deadly. Some people, it turns out, sleep very lightly, almost as if they have one eye open, which is exactly how snakes sleep, by the way. Got to be aware of what's going on around you. Fish, only half the brain sleeps at a time as they float in the ocean. Half the brain always monitoring where they're at and what's going on just a little bit to stay safe. Some people kind of sleep like that, I think. It turns out it's a way of being alert to danger. We're hardwired to pay attention to scarcity. And so everyone from marketers to politicians, and you'll be forgiven, of course, if you occasionally confuse the two, focus their energy and creativity on creating a sense of what we lack in order to promise that they can fill it. Too often, I too worry I worry about this a bit, that we've defined and constrained the gospel in the same way. To hear some, and I'll admit I've fallen in this rut from time to time, Jesus lived and preached and taught and fed and cured and was eventually crucified, all in order that God will overlook our misdeeds. Don't get me wrong, the forgiveness of sins, to be cleansed and made new, is central and important element of faith. But too often we spoke to it as the only element of faith, as if Jesus' life and death and resurrection were kind of a divine whiteout for the check marks against us on St. Peter's sheet up there at the gate. Which is why today I am grateful, and I need to remember throughout this year that this is how the gospel begins to remind us that grace isn't only about making up for something we lack, but also providing more than we ever imagined and certainly deserved. I mean, Jesus have, could have provided just enough wine to get by for the party to go on and end there in the early morning hours. And given that people have been drinking for a few days, even a pedestrian bottle would have certainly been well received. But he went way, way beyond expectations to provide more, to provide better wine than they ever could have expected. Why? Because that's what grace is. That's what grace looks like. So how might we surprise those around us with an abundance of blessings, I ask myself? What is it, in other words, that you have a ton of and other people need. 
Or maybe you only have a little, but are willing to share it. Is it a smile? Can you practice smiling at every person you see, whether familiar or not? Believe me, it will upset them and disturb them just a little bit. They're not used to that. It would be powerful. What about hugs or hospitality? How about picking up the phone and calling someone, saying, I've been thinking about you. I remember well when we did, and I look forward to. I see our congregation's abundance in providing space for recovery groups, recording groups, the weekly Riverside meal, the Boy Scouts. I thought this week how usually in this late January, early February, the CHAP group, Christian Hands at Practice and Prayer, I thought about the quilts we often make and send on to the hospital in Detroit, Mercy, for the infants born, and quilts sent out by World Vision and World in response to refugees, those quilts from the hands of Faye and Lois and Kathy and Carolyn and Joyce and Nancy and others, saints past and saints present that provide tangible comfort to those in need. And I say, let's join in. Let's join in and pass it on. Three weeks will be our annual meeting. However, about providing a treat to pass, but then again, we may be once more meeting virtually across air and space and time. Maybe we can pass a smile and pass a welcome. Tell a little story to each other about how you're doing. But you gotta ask how someone else is doing and sit back and listen deeply. For his grace will be upon us, his continent smiling upon us, for Christ is in our midst. The possibilities really are endless, another sign of abundance. May they remind us that grace is a free gift of God's generosity, and it's also the abundance of joy and blessing in life that are, certainly ours, through the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. So let us walk in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, I call upon you, if you've not made a pledge yet, to please submit one. We're waiting for a few to come in, including my own. So I will commit to turning it in this week. How about you? Take care.
Let our hearts be united in prayer. Gracious Lord, you have given us so many gifts, gifts and talents of the Spirit to heal, to share and to care, to pray with one another, to practice discernment of your way, to work for justice for all. For you prayed that we would be one in spirit, one on the way with you. You who take delight in us, blessing the children and teaching those walking with you. So gracious Lord, may we walk with you too. Teach us well this week and remind us of your power in baptism, of embrace and forgiveness, your delight at the wedding in Cana, to pour an abundance upon us, to give us enough for this day, and remind us always that we are yours, and therefore we are enough for the tasks at hand. Gracious Lord, we pray for the tasks at hand for the church, to feed the hungry, to clothe those who are naked, to visit those in prison, to pray with those who have a troubled spirit, to work for healing, to work for justice, to lift up the lowly, to challenge the mighty. Gracious Lord, hear our prayer. I pray and am thankful for ministers of the gospel. I pray for Brent Hoover, our friend in missions today, as he shares the message at the Chinese American Church in Ann Arbor this morning. I pray for our brother Christian Zebley in Tokyo. I pray for missionaries around the world who displace themselves so that you, they would be you where you can be seen and heard. Dearest Lord, I pray for members of our fellowship for healing, for Ed Grubaugh, for remission from cancer for Jennifer Renault, and comfort and strength for Bob Taylor, for continued recovery for Clyde Walker and Louise Woodruff, for healing from COVID and return home from the hospital for Nancy Spencer, I'm thankful for the clearing of his COVID for Mark Spencer, for the many doctors and nurses, counselors and social workers who give aid in these circumstances, for visiting nurses, for family members as they are called in to be caregivers, for teachers and students, that the environment would be a place they can learn, for the focus is on connection and growth in mind and body and in spirit. We pray condolences and comfort of the Holy Spirit upon Mariella and Harold Lanny, upon the death of their daughter Karen early last Sunday morning. May your spirit be upon them and give them comfort. Gracious Lord, hear our prayers. In this time and place, let us make space for God hear our hearts and for we to listen for the breath of the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, let us hold fast to the good news in Jesus Christ as we pray together as Christ taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen.
Remember and hold fast to the abundance that God has poured into our world and into each of us. Utilize your gifts that are manifold and present right now. Know that you go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, God, God is, is sending, sending us. us. Wherever we are, God, God has, has put us, us there. there. For God has a purpose in our being there. And Christ, Christ who dwells in us, has, has something he wants to do through us, us where we are right now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.